Hey, Cooper's Over Reformed Church. My name is Connor Mackey. I'm the director of Young Adults here at CRC. Just want to give you a heads up. Service starts in about one to two minutes. So if you haven't had the chance to, make sure you got yourself a cup of coffee, juice, tea, a cookie, whatever it is that you need to be comfortable. But also make sure that you've got a Bible with you today. If you're joining us in person and you have kids with us today, make sure they're checked into Kids Zone in the lobby somewhere down there, right? If you're joining us online, we wanna know where you're joining us from. Say hey in the comments below and let us know where you're joining from today. We also wanna encourage everybody to go to our website, coopersvillereform.com. There you can find resources and ways to get plugged into more community here at CRC. If you're joining us for the first time, click on I'm new, let us know where you're from, where you're going, what brought you here today. We believe at CRC in loving God, loving people and living sent. And on Sunday mornings, we get to come together and experience that together as a community. If you're watching online, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe, do all that sort of stuff. If you're joining us in person, you got about 30 seconds to get to your seat. Get ready to worship. We're ready for it. Let's worship together. house this morning. Oh, 
captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. Good morning. My name is Rachel Cunnan. I'm an elder here at Cooper's Royal Reformed, and I'm just really happy to welcome you here this morning. What a great song to start with, too. Um, I just want you to know that no matter who you are, what you know, what you don't know, there is a place for you here. And we hope you feel that as you walk in the doors. God chose the seat that you're in for you today. It's no accident that you're here. He has a word for you today if you're willing to hear it. So welcome. Um, if you are new here, we'd love to get to know you. In the bulletin, you'll find a connect card that looks like this. You could fill it out and after the service, walk down these stairs, you'll find a guest services counter and we'd love to just meet you and talk with you. Um, and also we have a free coffee cup for you. So we'd love to talk to you after the service. And if you're worshiping online, you can go to coopersvillereform.com, click the I'm New tab, and fill that information out there. I have a couple of announcements for you this morning. First of all, on Sunday, August 20, from 5.30 to 7.30, we will have a worship time and baptisms at Lake Michigan, and that is at the Maranatha Bible and Conference Center. If you're thinking about getting baptized, you can go online to coopersvillereform.com, click events, and you can tell us you'd like to be baptized that way. Also, you don't have to be getting baptized to come. We'd love to have you worship with us and just witness this amazing event. So that's August 20. Also in the fall, which isn't that far away actually, we have a men's retreat and a women's retreat. The men's retreat, like it says on the screen, is September 29 through August, October 1, and the women's retreat is October 13 through 15. Uh, the cost is $155 for the men's retreat and $165 for the women's retreat. Registration is open now, and you can go to coopersvillereform.com and register that way. And we also have partial scholarships available. If you uh, want to come but you aren't sure, you can foot the bill, so. Uh, lastly, thank you for your financial giving as we partner with what God is doing here in our church, in the community of Coopersville, and even globally. There are a couple different ways you can give. You can give as you walk out the front and the back. You'll see the offering plates there. And you can also go to coopersvillereform.com and give that way. Would you pray over the offering in the service with me, please? Oh, Jesus, how awesome it is to be here this morning. What a special time, really unlike anything else we get to experience throughout the week. A time to settle our minds and our hearts on you, a time to worship with people who love you. And God, we welcome you here in this place and we ask that you bless this service. As Pastor John teaches and as we sing songs, we ask that you would speak to us through your word and that we would somehow be transformed by the teaching of it. And God, we offer up our ties to you this morning as a way to acknowledge how good you are. For we know that every good and perfect thing comes from you. And I pray that everything we give is given genuinely. And we pray that what we give is used to advance your kingdom, God. We look forward to this time of worship. May it be pleasing to you. May it draw us in. May it make us closer to you. In your name we pray, amen. If you would stand as we continue to worship together, as we sing about his redeeming transformation, as we think about where we came from and where we are now, now that we have him. 
next song we are going to sing is inspired by Revelation chapter 5, um, verses 1 through 14, and it proclaims that God is worthy of all things. And as we sing the song, and if you read the passage later on today, when I invite you to, there's a lot of imagery depicted in the passage that can be um, complex and difficult to understand at times. However, this passage describes a scene in the throne room of God where the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who was slain, displays all power and authority and is declared worthy of all that power because of the work he had done on the cross. And the passage at one point points to this imagery uh, that describes the prayer of God's people as being like incense rising up to God. Um, and so as we sing this song, there's a bridge where we sing about incense rising day and night. Uh, and so as you, as you sing that and meditate on those words, um, we're, we're, we're praying and, and hoping and, 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 and saying that our, our prayer and adoration and praise goes up to God day and night and night and day. So let's declare Jesus the Lamb who is slain, who's worthy of all of our praise together now.
here together this morning as we consider the words of your scriptures. May it impact us. May it change our hearts that we can praise you and give you your glory, which is due to you because you are so worthy of it. Jesus, as, as we consider these words of your scripture, may it impact us. May it turn our hearts to you and may it conform us to the image, the image of you, the Lamb of God. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. You may have a seat. Good morning. My name is Bethany Corson, and I'm the director of children's ministries here. Um, quickly before I have all the kids come up to head to their classes, one of the things the kids love to do is tell me when it's their birthday, and they always like to have me know their birthday is maybe even in a month or whatever, but today is Pastor John's birthday. <laughs> and he didn't run telling me it was his birthday, but um, can we sing happy birthday to you, John? <laughs> Because that's what the kids love, is they love to be saying happy birthday, too. So the kids, kids, you guys sing it nice and loud for me, too, all right? Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor John. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. We're very thankful for you, John. So. All right. <laughs> Now, if you have a child who is kindergarten age down through preschool, um, they will be heading to Little Tykes Theater with Miss Michelle and Miss Michaela. At the end of the service, you can pick them up by heading down these stairs. The first door on your left in the hallway is Little Tykes Theater, and that's where you can pick them up. Then if you have a child who is first through sixth grade, will be heading down to Kid Zone with me. And at the end of the service, you can pick them up by heading out in the lobby and at the top of the Kid Zone stairs is where you can find them. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Dory Keller. I'm the youth director here in that picture of Josh at the end. That's how we all feel at the end of youth trips. Um, we went um, with 15 middle schoolers and four leaders at the end of June to Muskegon State Park um, on a, an adventure trip for them where we um, dug in deep with God and did some things that were beyond our comfort zone. And these girls are going to tell you about it. Hi, my name is Addie Keller, and I'm an incoming freshman at Coopersville and the youth director's daughter. This was my very last middle school youth group trip. It was such an amazing experience. I became closer to people I didn't know existed and learned more about the ones I did. We got to learn more about Jesus, but also have fun. We had a scavenger hunt the first night, which our team won. The next day, we went to a ski and luge to first do an Olympic race, then went zip lining, which I'm pretty sure I almost died. We split into two groups after that and either went luging or to archery. Then the next day we went kayaking for 12 miles, which they didn't tell us until the end. I got hit, I got hit by a tree and now have a permanent bruise, but whatever. Um, the main verse of the trip was Luke 13, 32. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. On the last night we have this thing called cry night, which is not cry night according to my mom. After we shed many, many tears, we sat there until midnight-ish, worshiping around the campfire. It was awesome to sit there and watch everyone, no matter who or where they came from, worshiping the Lord. And then, if you've ever seen, like, the church trailer, there's, like, a window on the top. And the first night, we woke up, and I'm pretty sure it was Josh went into the trailer, and there was bread eaten and um, Oreos, and there apparently was a raccoon. And then the second night, we woke up. Well, most people woke up. There was two girls that didn't wake up and none of the boys. So we had to wake up my dad. And then he was like hacking at a tree. No one still woke up. But there was raccoons on top of the trailer trying to get in. And they were very obnoxious and stuff. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alexis Meckes. And I'm also an incoming freshman. Uh, you may know my parents met in Heather Meckes. So about a month ago, the Crossroads Youth Group took a camping trip out to Muskegon. A four-day, three-night camping trip with no showers, outhouses that smelled like death, and about 15 teenagers. What could possibly go wrong? All I can say is there were raccoons, filthy feet, and no sleep. Now fast forwarding to the second day where we hiked out to the beach and did our group devotions. Now aside from the gorgeous sunset, something amazing happened. My very brave friend, Caitlin Van Velzen, saw a group of 10 30-ish year olds and invited them to come pray with us. They looked slightly terrified, but agreed. And like us, they all turned out to love Jesus and prayed powerful words over us and we did the same for them. When we got back to camp, I realized that that was one of the coolest things I've ever been a witness to, praying with a bunch of strangers on a beach at Lake Michigan. So the third night, we were asked to go off into the woods and find a spot to spend 30 minutes with Jesus at. To me, this seemed scary because it was something I'd never done before, but God worked strongly through my time and through a lot of other people's time. When the 30 minutes was up, we went back to the fire pit and split into girls and boys for the usual last night of youth group talk. Dory asked us all to share something deep and heavy. There were many tears and hugs that night, like a lot of tears. Um, and it was just crazy because like we all didn't really know each other at the start of the week and like no one had their best friend on the trip, but we all just bonded so much and it was really cool. Um, and so that brings me to like one of the main points of the trip that we as believers are like a flock, whether that's sheep or chickens. Um, <laughs> We're not meant to live life alone, and we should have friends and faith to share things with. We left this trip with many new friends, a stronger bond with God, and in desperate need of a shower. Good morning, church. I'm Pastor John, and I have the privilege of serving as lead pastor here. We are going to open up God's word. We're in Nehemiah chapter eight. If you're new with us here this morning or you're watching 
online perhaps, we have been going through a series um, over the last couple of months, and we have taken some breaks in between, but we are in Nehemiah chapter 8 today, and if you want to grab a blue hardback, if you didn't bring a Bible, you may do that somewhere below you, in front of you, or under you, and there should be a hardback page 389 again, and if you are able, would you rise for the reading of God's word? All the people, the word of God says in verse one, came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. Most likely children at a certain age, they can understand. I have a six-year-old. I don't know what that age is. Um, he, he faced the... He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water grate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion, something like a stage. Beside him on his right stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Massasiah. And on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malchijah, Hashem, Hashbadanah, Zechariah, and Meshalem. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatiah, Hodiah, Masiah, Kelita, Azariah, and Josabad, Hanan, and Paniah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord, do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice foods and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people saying, be still for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families along with the priests and the Levites gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem, go into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. This is some 50,000 plus people. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. 
Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with regulation, there was an assembly. Thanks be to God, this is the word of God. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Father, we want your word to be central in our time today. May your spirit minister to our hearts, but we don't simply want your word to be central for the next 30 minutes or so. We want your word to be central every day in our lives. We long for your word to bring the full slate of emotions that we just read in Nehemiah 8, from weeping to rejoicing. May your word bring about whatever you desire for it to bring about. Stir our hearts, Lord. Let us be excited as the people of God to gather in a community under your word. Give us such an appetite for your word. Father, we love you and we humble ourselves in submission to your word. It is in the mighty name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Let let me ask you a question this morning, church. How excited were you to come into God's place? for worship and to be under his word. How excited do you get for the sharing of God's word in community? How excited do you get? Does it fire you up on Sundays to come here and to gather under his word? Does it fire you up to meet with your small groups, to gather under his word? Does it fire you up, if you're a senior adult, to come to Bible study and to gather under his word? Do we get us fired up for this meeting today as we're going to get in about 40 days for the opening of the NFL season? Such trivial. But does it fire you up? Does it excite you? Does it bring you joy? Does it give you the full slate of emotions from weeping to rejoicing? I believe that is at least one of the major results of God's word actively forming God's people is that when they gather under the word of God, there is some sort of excitement. There's some sort of joy. That is God's formational word impacting the lives of his people in which he is forming. And as my brother Frank just shared in his prayer, he is conforming us into the image of God. This is what we are called to be doing. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it mistaken. Your sacrifice of getting out of your beds around 9 a.m. or some of you 7, 6 a.m. or some of you high school students 10.30 a.m. and you just got here, like this is a worthy sacrifice. God's word has been forming from the very beginning, God's word formed in creation all things. God's word formed Moses when he brought him before Pharaoh and led him to lead out the children of Israel from bondage of slavery to the Egyptians. God's word was forming then. God's word was forming when he brought him to Mount Sinai for the law so that the word would form them throughout their wilderness journey and even still today and for all eternity, God's word is forming. And Nehemiah's life has been impacted by God's word. Let me bring you back to Nehemiah chapter one. It was a couple months back, but Nehemiah's prayers were were that of God's forming word. God's word was forming Nehemiah's prayers. Even though he was in exile, not living in Jerusalem, his words were still formed by the God who he loved. Nehemiah is a man who is acquainted with God's formational word, and the word literally forms and directs his prayer life. Does the word form and direct your prayer life? So let me ask again, how excited do you get for the opening of God's word in community? I believe this was a major factor in Nehemiah's heart when he was so stirred up for the city back in Nehemiah 1 and 2. 
his heart for the city, for the, Jerusalem, the holy capital of God, was so that God's exiled people could come back and to be centered under his word, together in community. So when he heard about the burned down gates and the burned down walls and the rubble that was surrounding Jerusalem, he was hurt. He was in pain, he was in desperation. When you drive by a broke down church, you see, they're not gathering on Sundays like they were 40 years ago or 50 years ago. Does it break your heart the least bit? Nehemiah's heart was broken, but now they're here. And they didn't waste much time either. They just went right to it. This is about a week or so within that range since the last gate was put up. They had to deal with all of this battling and this struggle and this strife from enemies on the northeast, south, and west of them. Because anytime you're fighting to open the word, there's gonna be a fight against you. You need to know that this morning. And so Nehemiah is here. And what ends up happening, verse six says, all the people lifted their hands. You know you can do that here? You can lift your hands. You can praise. And they said, amen, amen. That is to say, we agree. Let it be. Let it be so. Amen and amen. Do you know you can say that here? We, amen. We didn't bring, like, we, when you come in, like our, our, our guest service people and those opening doors for you, don't come in with the, they don't give you tape over your mouths. You know that, right? That's intentional. But we don't do that. We want you to interact. They came in, they said, Amen. Amen, with their hands lifted high, and they bowed down. You know you can do that here? And they worship their God. You say, I might, act, I might look like a fool. You know you could do that here? You can look like a fool? Not to draw attention on yourself, of course not, but to worship your God. The word of God excited them was forming them. They were gathering under it in submission to him, the book. L let me show you a picture here. This is, I used to attend a 6.30 a.m. Bible study in my hometown in, in Bradley, Illinois, and I think this picture was taken 10, 12 years ago. I had to go back quite a while on my phone to find it. Every Saturday morning at 6.30 a.m., uh, a waitress and a cook would open up this little diner in Bradley, Illinois, right on the outskirts of Kankakee, Illinois, so that uh, a few of us men and young men and boys would be able to gather to study God's word together. And I remember, I, I just, for years we did this, or at least I was a part of this, I believe they're still doing it. I actually texted the man at the head of the table across from me this picture because it came to my heart, and I texted, his name's Mike Scruggs, and he said, we still gather. It's Saturday morning, 6.30 a.m. at the Village Diner. I said, praise God, but, but this was us. And one of the beautiful things about this here is that there are six generations present in this picture, six. There is the silent generation. That would have been my brother, uh, uh, Rod Franklin, who's the elder there at the table, about three to the right. There's baby boomers there, there's Gen X there, there's millennials there, I was one of them, may have been the only millennial. Generation Z was present and Generation Alpha was present. It's a couple of these young men to the left, you can see one, one is not in the shot, two next to Bryce there. Um, I'd often pick up a couple young men and bring with me, believe it or not, they'd wake up at 5.45 a.m. and I'm pretty sure what really got them excited initially was that John was going to be paying for their breakfast that morning, but it got them there and they're leaning in and drawing in to the word of God. Were you excited 
to come to church this morning and open up God's holy word. I pray that God would stir within you such an excitement. And please understand this, it's not only that excitement that's gonna get you here because there are gonna be times where you go through stuff. So if you're just drawing on excitement to get to church, guess what? There's gonna be some Sundays and you aren't going to make it. But overall, as a pattern, there should be some excitement, eagerness, anticipation that, God, get the family in the van. We're going to church. Reorient your lives. We're going to church. We do it for soccer. We do it for baseball. I'm serious. But all of a sudden, when it comes to the community of God, we can find ways to weasel around it. You know, there used to be a day, and there were problems in this day as well, but you go back two, three, four decades, some of y'all remember Sunday morning, Sunday night, right? Wednesday night, some of y'all Baptists, you remember Wednesday night. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and the error in our thinking then from what I hear was, well, that made us Christian because we come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we're super Christian. And guess what? That was an error in thinking then. But now the pendulum has shifted the whole other way where now people come and they say, we don't need the community of faith. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. I don't need a public one or a local church to come under. I have a personal one. I don't need a church. They're just a bunch of sinners. It was D.L. Moody who said, and there's room for one more. And so now we have allowed, even in church culture, the pendulum, Christian culture, the pendulum has shifted, where at one time it was like popular for Christians to go to church three or four times a week. Now it's popular for Christians to come to church three or four times a year under the word of God. But what happens here? They haven't met like this for 141 years. Some of y'all remember COVID. Remember that thing? Three years ago? A little over? You remember coming back? You remember just coming back? The, the excitement in this place was real. I mean, we were six plus feet apart, so masks and so all that stuff was still present and forget the opinions of all that. We were here. We were singing. We were reading. We were worshiping. And there was just this palpable excitement in the place. And the people of God, after 141 years, they're just giddy and they're literally like chanting, give us the word, go get the book, Ezra. And they get to the books of the law, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the book in five parts, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and they just want to eat it up. And guess what? Let me ask another question. How long is too long of a sermon for you? How long is it for you? I said, no, I, I'm serious. I told you. Yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to hear your voice. How long is too long for you? Two hours is too long. Like that? What? What is the, 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 what do you do? Talk to me. How long is too long? Okay, a couple hours. It fits me. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. Okay? Okay? They sat under the word of God, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and the preaching of it, the teaching of it, the Levites were gathering with people just to give further understanding for six hours, from sun up to noon. Six hours. And they were literally standing. You're welcome. Six hours. 
Now look, I'm not saying we need to go there, but that's how excited, like we're gonna change our service times to nine and 4 p.m., but that's how exciting it was for them. They hadn't been there in that place for any of them for their entire lives. They've only heard about it. They only heard stories. And here they are after all that work with all that opposition, here they are sitting under the word, and they're literally demanding that Ezra bring the book and teach that thing. And for six hours they do, and they're weeping. The Holy Spirit shows up. They just, they, you say, I thought the Holy Spirit only came Pentecost and beyond. No, he's been the third person in the Trinity forever. He's been convicting hearts forever. Yeah, we live in a special new covenant now, but I really believe the Spirit of God was working. We live in a world today, y'all know this, attention spans have narrowed dramatically. They say, and I did some research, the average human's attention span currently is 8.25 seconds. That is literally 4.25 seconds less than 2,000. So in 15 years, this was done in 2015. In 15 years, it has decreased by nearly 25%, the average human attention span. A goldfish's attention span is nine seconds. <laughs> the goldfish has surpassed us. Welcome to humanity in 2023, right? But it's interesting, something profound just happens when the word of God is open, doesn't it? Something profound often happens. It, it happens here in Nehemiah 8, and it happens still today, where people are supernaturally drawn into the word. Because this is the only book that you can read, and it can read you. You ever read the, the book? and you've been like, yep, oh, that's me. The book is reading you. The author of Hebrews says it's alive and active. It's, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It, it cuts and divides. It, it, it penetrates. But there's something powerful that can happen even to those of us with an 8.25 second human attention span. God's spirit can draw your attention span for longer than the average Instagram reel, TikTok, or Netflix doc. I remember graduating high school as a non-Christian. It was over that summer that I would end up submitting my life to Christ, summer of 2006. Greatest decision I ever made, second. Marrying Helen, first submitting my life to Jesus in 2006. And I, I give my life to Jesus, and I go to Kankakee Community College in the fall of 2006, and they put you in all these classes, some are prereqs, you know, you just need to, you need to be in there before you get into the meat of what you're gonna end up studying. And one of the classes that they had put me in was an introduction reading class and they said your reading scores were so low in reading comprehension that you need to be in this class and it was literally like a ninth grade reading level class and I was 18 years old and so here I am now filled with the Holy Spirit and coffee at that time so I also started drinking coffee at 18 I think the Holy Spirit worked with that and so it was like the Holy Spirit first and foremost and a little bit of the bean, and I was in this, I was in this class, and, and soon, soon, like in the middle of the semesters, about seven or eight weeks in, I believe, that the teacher came to me and said, young man, I'm not too sure why you're in this class. Your reading comprehension is just fine. It's great, and it was at that time where I got to share with her my newfound love for Jesus, and how his word, at this time I had been reading his word several times a week, several times a day, sometimes, and I was just filled with his word, and so my mind felt renewed and fresh, as it says in Romans, that your mind would be renewed by the washing of the word. 
My mind was renewed by the washing of the word. So I got to share a little bit of Jesus with her. And I remember at that time, because I was like passing them out in the class, like I also had a mixtape that I had wrote and produced and rapped on. And, and me and the buddy uh, that I rapped on it with, were called, we called ourselves truth spitters. And so I remember like, yeah, like spitters. And I remember I gave that to her and it was literally just a burnt disc with my handwriting, which is horrible on it, saying truth spitters. And I'm sure when she received that, she thought, yeah, he should be in this class, right? Like, <laughs> good idea. But my point is this. When God's word through God's spirit gets a hold of a person, you can become a statistical anomaly. Or it's like, it doesn't make sense how much of this you can grasp and comprehend. It just doesn't make sense. You're like, man, I never did that with Harry Potter. Man, I never did that with this and that. Well, yeah, it's because there's something powerful about this book and the spirit that draws you to him. Because this book is authoritative. Unlike any other book, this book is authoritative. The people of God here are just so excited. It says in verse nine that all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the book of the law. They've just been weeping. And it was that right response of weeping that opened the doorway to the blessing of rejoicing. Did you catch that? Like Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites are like, okay, they're weeping, like that's great, but it's like, let them know. Let them know that there needs to be joy in this place. Let them know like, this is the day of our Lord. You don't need to weep any longer for the joy of the Lord is your strength, verse 10 says in Nehemiah 8. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Some of you now are in a season of weeping and I'm telling you, if you would just reorient your life under this word, that season of weeping will not last forever. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Weeping only lasts for a season. When you reorient your life under God, the psalmist says in Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Do you believe it? Have you experienced it? The songs that we sung this morning couldn't have been any better. He turns mourning into dancing. He turns graves into gardens. He turns bones into armies. He took broken down walls in Jerusalem and he restored it and filled it with people filled with his spirit and filled with his word. Do you think God can do that here in Coopersville and beyond? He can, he will, he, he longs to. This is the word of God. I remember first reading through the word of God and starting out in the gospels and moving to the book of Acts then finally getting to the book of Romans, which for me I think is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And I remember reading things like, oh, that hurts, right? I, I began my reading journey and I realized that, oh no, I was at enmity with God Oh no, no one's good, no, not one. Oh no, like I'm a worshiper of my self-interest. And I remember just reading and being like, amen, amen. I am that, or I was that, amen. I was a child of wrath. For a good season of my life, I was, as Romans 1 puts it, suppressing the truth, as Tony Evans says. I was like taking an inflated volleyball and trying to keep it under the water and just hold it there, and eventually that thing's gonna pop up and hit you. That's what I was doing with the righteousness of God. Yes, amen, amen. The book was reading me. But the weeping from the conviction of being under God's word soon turned into rejoicing for all that God has done and all that he longs to do. And we see that here in Nehemiah 8. They went from weeping to feasting. Did you catch that? From weeping to feasting. Then the men come back later. And just remember this, that there's 13 people on stage and Ezra. 
13 people on stage and Ezra, and there's also a group of Levites teaching as the word of God is being proclaimed and taught. God, that is why this church will not be driven by a single personality. Didn't Rachel do a great job last week? Didn't Rachel do a great job? We will continue to have a plurality of leaders and teachers and elders teaching the word of God here and being sent out and equipped. Because it was never planned to just be one primary spokesperson. The church, if possible, should have a plurality of leaders and teachers and gifts that are operating within the church. And there in verse 13, it says like the men are coming back from like a men's group. They're all studying the word of God. In verse 13, the heads of the house, the men get together and they, they got to the portion of the Torah, the book of instruction, where they read about the Feast of the Booths, the festival of shelters. And these shelters represented the temporary housing the Israelites erected during the wilderness wanderings. And essentially they say, hey, we, it's the seventh month. We, we need to do that. It happens to be the seventh month in our calendar as well. Like we, we need to do that. We need to do that. We're, so honey, pack up the kids. I'll get the camping gear and we're going, right? What happened there? What was the result of that? Look at verse 17, the back half of it. Nehemiah 8.17, I'll put it on the screen for you. Nehemiah 8.17 says, the result of them reorienting their lives under the word of God, reading and saying, yeah, that's right, we need to do this. Their joy was what? Very great as a result. There's joy all over this chapter, the theme. And so they go camping for seven days. It's really like a worship camping experience. By the way, men's group, men's retreat coming up, it's glorified camping. Like you're not, like the beds are, I don't know, we're in a new place. They might be a little wider, a little longer, I hope, I doubt it. <laughs> and we're going camping-ish. Men, you need to sign up for that. Like the women right now are, are, I think, kicking our tush when it comes to numbers. Women have signed up for the women's retreat. And, and let me be real, it's often a greater sacrifice for a woman to sign up with kids and, and everything. Oftentimes, it becomes a greater sacrifice for the ladies to sign up, but they're still whooping, whooping us, I think, in numbers. Men, where are you at? I've been texting guys throughout the week. If you got a text from me, just know I love you. If you didn't get a text from me, it's probably because I might not have had your number, but I'm gonna, I'll, and if I'll find it, I, we, have, we have a directory. You need to be at the men's retreat, if at all possible. Women, go to the women's retreat. They're camping, they're worshiping God. It's beautiful. I know some of us are indoorsy. I'm one of them. I, I'll take a Hilton over a sack of hay any day. But I wanna end on this, because this is the teaching point. Essentially, what the people of God do was they end up orienting their life around the word of God. Simply. They open it, they're reading it, or it's being read to them, and they hear it, and they go, we need to do that. We need to do that. What have we been doing? We need to do that. Some of us here, have generational patterns that are ugly. You know, I know, my own. We have generational patterns that are ugly. From generation to generation to generation, similar sin struggles. Some denominations, they'll call the generational curses. I won't go that far. But sin struggles that are common in your ancestry. And you're living in them, and you're wrestling with them from alcoholism to drug abuse, from laziness to overwork, from sexual deviance to sexual abuse. You're living in this. 
you've been impacted by generational sin struggles. You know the patterns, and perhaps the Holy Spirit is even putting his finger on some of them right now. Do you want to know what I believe some of the weeping was when the word of God was being read here in Nehemiah 8? I believe it was the sentiment of why weren't we doing this sooner? What took so long? Some of you live in that, that struggle today of like, what took so long? Why am I 40, 50 plus years, and, and now I'm just starting to get it? What took so long? For some of us today, we feel that. You might be feeling that for yourself. You might be feeling that for a loved one. Let me share some good news with you. As long as there's breath in your lungs, you can place yourself under the obedience of God's word. And although it will and should produce a deep level of conviction, by the way, not to be confused with condemnation, God's spirit will bring conviction and people will often bring condemnation or the enemy will often bring condemnation, always will bring condemnation. It will soon be followed up though, if it's of God, it'll soon be followed up with great joy if you just stay under the reorienting of your life under his word. If you just stay there, I know at first it can hurt. I know at first it can be difficult to read things and to have things read you and say, that is me, that hurts, that's hard. It's messy, it is. Some of you are thinking, well, this wasn't the story of my parents. Perhaps it wasn't the story of your grandparents or great-grandparents. As far as we know, I'm a first-generation Protestant Christian in all of our line. This generational Jesus stuff is new for me and my last name as well. We're gonna continue to do our best as a family to come under the obedience of God's word, train our daughter up in it, and see generational sin patterns come to an end in the name of Jesus. We believe he can do that. We know he can do that. And although that has come with seasons of deep conviction and weeping, <laughs> I can gladly testify today that we are living and breathing testimonies of the joy of the Lord being our strength. And so many of you here today are as well. You need to hang on. You need to hang in there. You need to continue to reorient your lives under his word. We wanna to continue to see that for this church for men and women to say enough is enough and place their lives under the full obedience of God's holy word, not as legalists, but as those living in spirit-driven obedience and in the joy of the Lord that comes under the new covenant of God. We want you to live in that. What a beautiful name that name is of Jesus Christ. And may every rival be conquered and every generational pattern be crushed under his foot. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we love your word. Father, I pray for the person here this morning and the people here this morning who came in and they just being real, like it was just obedience that brought them here, but now you're stirring up within their heart something more than just that. And obedience is a beautiful thing. But Father, I pray that you would stir within their heart the joy of the Lord. And may it be their strength despite feelings despite circumstances. That happiness is all about happenings, but your joy can supersede the happenings in this life. I pray, Father, that you would stir our hearts, that you would continue to teach us as we reorient our lives under your word. For perhaps for some, they've had their lives reoriented or oriented under your word in a season, but now, they're wandering. They're so, they're just out there. Father, I pray that your spirit would draw them back through conviction from your spirit. 
And God, I pray for the generational sin patterns that so many of us can see, and I'm sure it's no different than those in Nehemiah 8. They could see, like, man, where was this? Like, where was this prior for the rest of my life? I, I, we just wish we had more of this. I pray, God, that that thought right now for someone in this place would not consume them, but they would move from that and they would move on to joy that they are here today with breath in their lungs to rejoice for the joy of the Lord is their strength. Father, minister to our hearts as we worship and sing in this last song. Let us have whatever posture it is that you are provoking us to have and let us worship you deeply in spirit and in truth. God, we love you and we worship you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. If you would stand, if you are able, as we continue to worship, it's all because of his name, amen? Not because of anything we do, but all because of his powerful, holy, and beautiful name. You were the word of the
pray with me. Allow God's word to wash over you as we, as we pray. What then, in Romans 8 it says, shall we say in response to these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one, Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, thank you for your victory. Father, your word points to Jesus. Your word points to you. Your word brings us to you, God. And Father, we are grateful for that. Thank you for the salvific work that you have produced in so many people here. And Father, I thank you for the salvific work that you are producing in so many people here. Father, we worship you, we praise you, we adore you. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you will and forever reign. And may we place our lives, reorienting all of ourselves under your word and continue to lead, continue to bring us to that place, God. I pray for the person who is in this season of weeping. They're in this season of pain and hurt. Our Father, I pray that you would reveal to them that the joy of the Lord is their strength and that you would walk them into that place ever so gently. Bring them there, Father. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your community that we get to be a part of. And we give you all the praise, honor, and glory for it is all due to you that we are here today. God, we love you. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you just, you're just not ready to leave, uh, we would love to pray with you. There are people that will be scattered throughout this sanctuary, just ready and willing to pray with you. If, if not, God bless you and have a great day.